Welcome, everyone, back to another episode of Faithfully Engaged. I'm uh, really happy to have this uh, really neat guest today, getting into some fun topics today. His name is Matthew. So, Matthew, go ahead and and tell the audience just a little bit about yourself and and, um, just kind of explaining who you are to the the, uh, audience today. So, uh, Matthew, it's good to have you on today. Hello, nice to nice to be on the show. My name is Matthew Karchner from Central Pennsylvania originally. Um, now I'm over here in Cambodia, which is a country, a small country next to Vietnam, pretty far away, and uh, serving as a missionary over here. Started out in 2016, came over to Southeast Asia, and did a lot of kind of relational street street evangelism, marketplace evangelism, kind of natural flow as the Lord led. Um, a foreigner over here sticks out quite a bit, and so uh, in the marketplaces, people want to know where you're from, why, why are you here, and how long have you been here, and can you speak the language, and things like that. And so the Lord naturally leads through questions into gospel sharing, testimony sharing. The Lord delivered me from a gay lifestyle 13 years ago, praise the Lord. I was born and raised in a Christian home, but followed my deceitful heart into a gay lifestyle. And... Uh, Really, the Lord brought to, brought me to my knees in repentance through some really difficult stuff. Uh, so today, these days, the Lord leads to share um, share the gospel with anybody He leads me to, but but really to focus on those that kind of uh, what we would normally call when people say unreached people groups. You think of tribe people in in remote areas, but the LGBT really, for the most part, is an unreached people group. And so those that, that the, the mainline churches don't typically, uh, you know, go out and really throw arms around. And so that's kind of my role is to, to engage those folks, knowing what it feels like, knowing what that deceitful heart feels like and how Satan can deceive and our corrupted human nature. And Satan plays well with that and how convincing those feelings can be, the gender confusion, and the same sex attraction and all that. And so there's compassion there. He who has been forgiven much loves much and so that's been Mm. uh, the past 13 years for me and the lord recently led to to open a church here to plan a small church here in the neighborhood where i've been living since 2018 had been teaching the kids in the neighborhood which is also something that happens typically organically when a missionary comes over here to southeast asia to a a country like cambodia there was genocide and war here back in the 1970s Mm. Uh, about a third of the population roughly was wiped out And so a lot of the folks here are youth, and youth are much more open, tend to be much more open to the gospel message. Also with today, the endorsement of the LGBT agenda kind of around the world, sadly with the U.S. usually leading that charge. um, There's also opportunity within a youth ministry to speak against that, to, to not follow our deceitful hearts. Our hearts are deceitful. The feelings that come into our hearts and the thoughts that come into our heads are not necessarily of the Lord, right? Even after we've given our lives to him and we're following him faithfully, we still battle with the flesh within and with Satan's demonic influence through the world. And so um, so it's really important to get that message into the minds of youth that they know that that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is greater. He who is in us is greater than he who is in this world. If you surrender your life to Christ, he gives you the power, the supernatural power through the Holy Spirit and dwelling the heart of the believer to fight, to wrestle against that temptation. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, so it's a daily battle. And I'm here to, to look for soldiers, to evangelize like I evangelize, to train them up, uh, to be combatants against the world and the enemy and, and the demonic agenda of today. Um, Buddhism is not about 96% of the population here. About 96% of the population here is reported to be Buddhist. And so uh, that's also a, a big... Uh, a mountain to climb, you could say, in addition to to just the the, the things that everybody battles around the world as, uh, you know, coming up in, in youth and young adulthood. There's also that indoctrination through school, through family, uh, the teachings of Buddhism and karma and um, worship of demons, really literal worship of Satan to appease the demons, to, to earn merit and, and good luck and that sort of thing is heavily taught and heavily indoctrinated on the youth here. And so... Um, there's much ministry here, much work to do. Praise the Lord. It's, it's a really exciting ministry and an exciting place to be called to. I feel so blessed and so thankful to be called to Cambodia. Yeah. 
No, th- thank you for for that background information there. And I- I'm curious on on my side, uh, you know, here in the United States, um, of course, as as we're recording this too, this is this is June, so it's it's kind of the Pride Month, so stuff is everywhere um, of just LGBT things like that. Um, so we we're, we come to expect that in the United States, um, for better or worse, but. Cambodia is not a place that I think most people would think, oh, like, are is there anybody that's LGBT over there? Um, so kind of tell us uh, your experience of seeing that, like that unreached people group, like you said, of, of LGBT there, specifically in Cambodia. Was that surprising to you seeing that there or, or kind of just walk us through that community specifically in Cambodia? Yeah, when you uh, when you've really been brought to your knees, really to the end of yourself, and like I was in my past thirteen years ago, really brought to the end of myself in, in addiction and all kinds of stuff. Um, nobody has to remind me that I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You know what mm. I mean? <laughs> mm. And I think that that's that's one thing that's missing in in uh, a lot of the mainline churches that we forget that we've been. We've been rescued so many years before, and maybe we came to Christ as a kid and never really fell away as a, in, a, in a really deep sense, you know what I mean? And so we kind of forget and we kind of feel like, maybe I've reached a state of sinless perfection or almost there. It's like, hey guys, none of us have, not one man or woman on this entire planet, uh, whether it's the greatest pastor on earth or whatever, has reached a state of sinless perfection. So we forget that our thoughts and and the intents of our heart and the, the longing to gossip and do different things, the sins that are approved within the church, we don't realize that those are also sins. And so, um, so for me, it was actually the opposite coming over here. I engaged a, a pastor when we came over here for short-term missions and so on, and he was a little bit of a guide the first uh, days and weeks and months. And I said to him on one of the short-term missions, I said, what about homosexuality in Cambodia? And he said, we don't have that here. And I thought, oh, that's literally impossible that you don't have homosexuality in an entire nation. That's not possible. As of the fall in Genesis chapter three, it's it's everywhere, right? It might not be mm-hmm. it might not be uh, endorsed and approved everywhere, but it's in every country, whether it's Muslim or highly masculine countries or whatever we like to think. There's homosexuality everywhere. There's sin everywhere. And so um, for me, it was opposite. It was kind of like, where is it? I don't see it openly, so where is it going on? And um, it's been interesting because I came here first in 20, 2011 was the first short-term mission. There was barely a, a sign of it. If you looked around on the streets, even in the big capital city, almost nothing, no trace of it. And so um, sadly, 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 as... Uh, like I say, I like to take responsibility, accountability. My nation is really leading the charge. Sadly, we were a Christian nation before. Now we're leading the charge and endorsing all kinds of bizarre sins. And this is one of them. So as the, as the U.S. Uh, raises the rainbow flag and announces Pride Month and so on, the other countries are following along, like like America and Hollywood and all that's leading. So. So it's becoming more and more approved and accepted in Thailand. Thailand is next to Cambodia, roughly the same culture, but more economically developed, kind of like an older cousin or an uncle to Cambodia. So the folks look up at Thailand like, that's that's what I want to be like. And so as it's being more and more approved in Thailand and becoming more and more normalized, Cambodia over the years has, has gradually, gradually accepted. But even when I came here in 2011, 2016, even didn't see much of it at all and now now it's commonplace here in my even in this town where i'm living which is not a big city it's it's a small city that's really interesting um that just on the uh kind of the the cultural um push again in in the united states uh we have certainly seen changes o- over the years of of more and more um acceptance you can look at some of the polling of uh gay marriage and things like that of uh, of not that long ago it was largely disapproved and now it's largely approved here but 
that is something that I think as Americans we have a we have some blinders on that we only see our neck of the woods. The the rest of the world doesn't really matter. It's just the United States. That that's kind of a common uh, American issue. And to your point, what happens here? It doesn't just stay here. It, it does. We are kind of trendsetters in a lot of different things, and both some of the good things that we have spread, but also bad things. Um, So things that we do here, it doesn't just impact us here. It impacts the whole world. Um, And I I, I guess for on your end, you're seeing this more accepting in a place like Cambodia that traditionally isn't that way. Uh, What, uh, how does that change your approach um, and your ministry to be able to to minister uh, to these to these youth that are kind of getting this new wave of of homosexuality, LGBT, gender ideology, all of that. Now that it's out in the open, has that made it easier for you to to minister to them? Like, what? How has your approach changed as you've seen that been more and more open? Uh, you know, you you think about someone who who's struggling with some unusual situation in life and feels like feels so isolated and alienated. Like I have these feelings and nobody gets me. No one understands it. And so the average guy in the church goes out and maybe tries to witness with someone to someone struggling with homosexual, homosexual desires. And they feel like this guy doesn't have a clue where I'm coming from. He has no idea. So it's, it's like talking to a wall. And so that's the power of the testimony that, when you've been through something, you can reach people like forgiven sin is ministry. The Lord uses that testimony to reach folks. And so that can be a silver bullet. Does that all, is it always, oh, is it always welcomed with open arms? Not really. Mm-hmm. The young guy is caught, set up, set in his ways. He's having fun doing what he's doing. He doesn't want to hear. He might scoff and mock and laugh, but the Lord can speak that, that word back to him later in the future when he's in a, in a time of despair. And so, uh, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If such were some of you, right, First Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, that you were washed, you were sanctified, you were, the, the Lord can forgive those who are willing to repent and put their faith and trust in him. May still, may still wrestle with that, those desires for the rest of our lives, but that's, that's just part of it. Just like the alcoholic surrenders, um, His will for God's will gives his life to Christ, and he might still struggle with the longing to have a drink for the rest of his life. But that's just reality. That's that's we're fallen a fallen race, and the Lord gives us the supernatural power to fight forward if we're born again, if we've repented, put our faith and trust in Him. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ for a way out. Uh, Absolutely, and I, I think that's a piece there, and something you've referenced earlier of the sin of all of us. And that's something convicting of um, people that that don't struggle with any type of uh, homosexuality or gender ideology or anything like that. That's never been a struggle. It becomes a an us versus them. Yeah, I, I got it all figured out. You guys are all the bad ones. So um, good versus evil and, and we're going to win. And there is a sense of good versus evil, but the, the good versus evil is 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 Christ uh, against sin. Um, we're not the good guys here, and and that needs to be reminded of us all that the only good that's in us is due to Christ. Nothing that we have have done. So, yeah. all of that being said, like you mentioned, your testimony is um, important and um, can really lean in to some of these youth that are. Um, r- really being swept into the, some of these um, cultural changes and some of these sinful desires. What would your advice be for people that maybe aren't that way, that have never had any type of homosexual desire or anything like that? How can they still love the LGBT community in a really loving way without having that testimony? Yeah, I... I think the only way is to be humble through humility to realize that that I'm just a sinner saved by grace too, and and I always uh, use the example of the guy who's never struggled with homosexuality, but there's a 
maybe there's a young man who comes into the church and and I'm someone who's never struggled with homosexuality, but I want to reach him. I have a heart for him. I want to reach him for Christ, and I want to I want to try to bridge the gap or stand in the gap for him. Um, I think the best thing to do is to try to build a relationship, to build trust, and um, to be honest about about your own struggle. Like every man's struggle typically is lust, whether they like to admit it or not. Somebody, uh, most men who have struggled with pornography at some point or another. Um, Cigarettes, alcohol, you name it, anger is a big one for men. So if we're talking about men here, those are those are probably some of the most common ones. And um, if we can be honest about our, our struggles and our victories and our not yet theirs with, with those folks, I think that's uh, something authentic, an authentic foundation for relationship when the trust is built and we can share that kind of difficult, embarrassing testimony and, and try to reach that person through that and and um, allow the Lord to work through that humility to, to build trust and to, to be someone they can pray with and, and share what's going on and fight together to, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not easy for anybody. Yeah, no, I think that humility that you mentioned is incredibly important and something that every Christian needs to keep in check because, yeah, it, it, we have done nothing. Um, we, we are all... Uh, deserving of hell. Uh, we have all fallen short, and it's only because of Christ, nothing that we have done. So I think that humility, like you mentioned, even mentioning some different sins that, um, goodness, you mentioned pornography, that's an incredibly common thing. Um, uh, you, you're more likely to run into somebody that has than has not. And being honest with that when you're sharing um, the gospel that, yeah, that's not I have sinful desires too, so it's not me. It's Christ. Christ is the one that is uh, is perfect and has saved me from these things. Now, I think that's great of of what you described there, especially uh, of you know when you're when you're witnessing. But we definitely see this here, and I imagine you've been running into some of that in Cambodia. Of well, homosexuality. Like, why are you telling me that this is? Like, yeah, you, you, maybe you you struggle with these things over here, but I'm just loving who I need to love. Like that homosexuality is not, not a problem. It's it's to be celebrated. Um, what, what would your response be either to the person that is struggling in that sin or even the Christian that wants to just say, no, it's that's not a sin. That's, that's not a problem. Uh, what should your response be to somebody like that that's not acknowledging that it's even a problem? Yeah, my parents uh, field this question sometimes. If we're when I'm when I'm home for like a Christmas break or something, sometimes we'll get into churches together, and, and my parents will stand up and field some questions. And the one thing, kind of, how did they handle the war? How did they handle me telling them I'm gay and you better just accept it and all that? And they really stood on God's word and and wouldn't budge. Like we love you, but but we love the Lord more. We choose him and his word over you. We're sorry, but we're not going to embrace you and tear pages out of God's word. That's not how it works. And so praise the Lord. They, they stood on God's word. And I really feel that in part due to their, uh, due to their obedience, the Lord really made that midnight run in my life where he brought me to my knees in repentance where there was no other way out, but to look up and give my life to him in a real way. Um, I, I, grown up in the church and had some kind of shallow faith before. But anyway, um, they would say that uh, okay, the my mom my mom commonly says, I was praying for bad things to happen in your life. And nobody wants to hear that doesn't sound good, like that doesn't sound like a mother's heart, but they were praying for short-term pain in order for long-term gain, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like yeah. even if he has to lose friends, even if he winds up in the hospital, even if whatever whatever it takes, just bring him back to you, Lord. And that really was a mother's heart, although it doesn't sound at first glance like it was. But they uh, they really wanted my my soul in heaven more than me to be happy for a day or a week here on earth. And so I'm so thankful for Christian believing parents. So I would say, you know, stand on the word of God and don't budge. Um, 
don't embrace the sin because the, the pressure is so great from culture nowadays and so great from society that we just want to say, oh, let's throw out God's word for today and just hug and talk about nice things and Disney. But really, uh, we really have to stand on the word and say the bad news is this is sin. And there's no way out but repentance. The good news is that Jesus Christ is the way out. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. If you're willing to repent, put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll give you the power to fight against this, and he'll forgive it all. Praise the Lord. Um, there's not really an easy silver bullet answer to that other than pray that the Lord brings them to their knees. And, and sadly, I think that's what it takes in a lot of cases. You go out and, and somebody has money and, and relatively no problems in life, I don't think they're going to look up. My grandma used to say, sometimes you have to be flat on your back before you look up, and that's how it was for me. Mm -hmm. So it can be a long time. It's not It's not a one-and-done, uh, hocus-pocus kind of solution. Typically, it's it's a war. It's a real spiritual war. And people would go, my parents went to war in spirit, prayer and fasting. They prayed and fasted for me as the, the Lord led through the pastor. Um, it was years. It wasn't. It wasn't days or weeks or months. Mm. And uh, praise the Lord for their obedience. Yeah, his faithfulness. No, I, I, I think that's uh, that's a wonderful talking about testimony. Just testimony on your parents' part of that steadfastness on on the word. That where these things are are clear, we're not we're not budging. Um, and that's different than, um, I think some superficial steadfast of, um, this is a really extreme example, but, uh, somebody that's like, like Westboro Baptist church that's protested all these things. Um, I, I don't think any of them have done anything out of, out of love. It's just, uh, uh, throw and, and scream at people and, uh, just do all these protests for attention. Um, so we're not saying that, but God's word is God's word. Um, it's, it's not our word, and it's it's sufficient, and we're going to stand on that. And that's something that showing love is really important that we have, a for one, a biblical view of love, but also just a, a deeper view of love. Uh, I'll, I'll throw my, um, my kids as an example. There's times that my kids don't want to go to bed and it's loving for me to say, no, you're going to bed, even though that makes their, their feelings get hurt and they don't like that. That's a loving thing. Now, obviously what your parents did was much deeper, much more difficult, took years, I'm sure tears and all sorts of turmoil over that. So I'm not saying it's as easy as me telling my kids to go to bed, but that steadfastness and not letting emotion be the guide and letting truth be the guide. Um, powerful, powerful stuff. But if you are a parent in that situation, or if you're, if you have a loved one or whatever, you do need to be prepared for the long haul. Um, kind of like your parents were maybe in God's, uh, God's grace that it, it won't be that long for others, but um, some that kind of that return never happens. Um, and I, I think that's where our faith being in Christ and being in God's word above all um, is incredibly important because if we're just waiting to feel better, um, that's going to be superficial. It's not going to be nearly as deep as, as Christ and biblical love really is. Amen. Abraham and Isaac kind of saying a Job situation, those come to mind. I mean, they, my parents, it, it went so far with me. It went so far that they really, my dad said to my mom at one point, I don't think we're going to see you again. And that was going to have to be okay. You know what I mean? It, they, they trusted the Lord and, and they did what they could and they fought for the Lord. They fought for his word. They fought for what was best for me eternally, not, not the here and now necessarily, but eternally, right? And so um, yeah. they gave it all up and, and they got back. The Lord gave them back what they gave. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And that's, that's where that faith is. Um, that, uh, y your parents and if those of any of you listening that uh, have a, have a family member or goodness, you yourself are, are 
struggling with any type of um, homosexual desires. The big one now is really gender ideology. Um, if you are uh, concerned of whether you're in the right body or whatever, um, really going in, in faith and bringing that to Christ. Because sometimes when we as believers, uh, we're like, well, Hey, what your par- parents could say, well, Matthew left. There's nothing I can do about it. And then kind of wipe my hands. Um, if we just do that and then we don't go in prayer, we are basically communicating that. Yeah, I don't God, I don't think you can do it. Um, and that's not good. Uh, we're, we don't get to dictate what, what he does or not, but we need to put that faith and that earnestness in prayer. Um, and I think that, again, that, that's a wonderful testimony on your parents. And I hope, like I said, any of you listening that have dealing with anything similar, that's a good place to start. Read scripture and pray for their souls. Um, and Stand. where scripture is clear, be clear. Stand on the word and don't budge. Um, another thing, I, I think that if they had endorsed, if I look back on my situation, it, it sounds brutal. Maybe some of the, the, the position they took sounds maybe brutal to some people. Um, but I think if they had endorsed in any way, you know what I mean? If they had said, if they had, uh, continued to send me money and endorse my lifestyle and kind of enable it, if you will, I think I probably would be in hell right now. You know what I mean? It would, it would have made them feel good for the moment and everybody would have applauded. And probably a lot of people in the church would have said, you know, that's what Jesus would do. He would call us to love no matter what. Oh, it. It, it really was not what the Lord was leading to do at all. His, his word was leading to, uh, if you love son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of it. You're not worthy of me, right? That's what they were called to do. Abraham to Isaac, um, to, to give me up to, to honor the Lord, to, to honor his word above anything else on this earth. And so that's what they did. And that's what I recommend that others do difficult as it is. Absolutely. Yeah. That, a great example there. The sacrificial is really what what comes to mind. Which, you know, Abraham and, and Isaac. That that's a perfect example for that. And not easy. I'm I'm sure your parents would agree. Not not easy. But God's God's word, God's love is is worth it. Um, and and standing on that, like you've mentioned. I, I wanted to go back into Cambodia just for a little bit. Of, um, I know the the ministry that you're doing there is. Sounds like it's really needed, especially in a part of the world that um, some of the openness of LGBT stuff is really new. Um, but going back to, to several years past when you first started there, how, how did you get led into Cambodia? Like, what was that process like, even just making it there in the first place? Can I kind of answer the question and then maybe branch out just a little bit? I yeah, really absolutely. wanted to talk about one thing. <laughs> um, so I was with a big church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they had they had uh, missions partnerships, they called them, with many countries in Africa and Asia and different places. And there was a lot of opportunity through that church, very missions-minded. Uh, and so at one point, the pastor said, if you're interested in the new Cambodia partnership, please go downstairs at 10 a.m. this morning for an information session. So I went downstairs and, and the Lord had, had delivered me months before or maybe even weeks before. I'm not sure exactly what the day was that this happened, but it was within the first several months of my new life in Christ where I was I felt like I had just been hosed down, washed clean in the blood, and, and here I am, like, what what's next? Who am I now? What do I do? Lord, what, do you, what would you have me to do? And so I went downstairs and uh, I sat in the back row and there it was very much an information session. There was nothing passionate or emotional or spellbinding or anything about it. It was just um, the leader kind of giving his initial thoughts. He had been over to Cambodia on a scouting mission. He had a little video of him riding around in the back of a tuk-tuk and kind of initial strategic thinking about how we could engage the churches there and things like that. And it, I think it wouldn't have mattered what he said. <laughs> the tears just started to flow and I felt the Lord's presence. And it was like, this is it. This is what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what it means. I don't know anything. I just know I'm supposed to join. So I joined and um, 
I felt the Lord had called me to be a missionary in some capacity. I, I wasn't a thousand percent sure that meant full-time missions tomorrow. I worked at a bank and, and I was with the bank ultimately for almost 15 years before the Lord called me out. But he trained me in unusual ways through that kind of back office banking career. And so um, long story short, the Lord led over short term missions with that church, my first church down in Pittsburgh after the Lord called me out of my old life and praise the Lord. So that was pretty interesting and was over here three times on different missions in the last couple of very small groups like me and another person the one time and me and two other people another time but i led i led a couple of very small groups and um it was just just pretty amazing and, and profound what the lord did on those short trips and really kind of got my feet wet and in, in what things are like here and the lord gave me a heart for the people and i felt like i don't i didn't even know where cambodia was on the map before i came over here and now now i feel like i belong here and um so that's how the Lord led, and, and when he led out of the banking career, I'd worked for PNC Bank down in Pittsburgh. It's another long story. I'll try to make it short. I had worked for PNC Bank down in Pittsburgh and had moved around with them a bit and had been with them almost 15 years by the time that the, the LGBT agenda became very strong in the U.S. with uh, the U.S. Supreme Court approving gay marriage. This was 2015. And we had a new department head in the legal department at PNC who really, really championed the LGBT agenda even more than the, the general corporation did kind of following suit behind the government. And so they required that my boss was requiring that I not really personally requiring intentionally, but like the, the workload that he had for the people under him included stuff that was tangled in with the LGBT agenda. For example, I was, I was the one who did the content for the, the website for the department. And a lot of the updates for the week would have to do with LGBT diversity and inclusion, promoting LGBT folks and promoting those folks from within and recruiting more and all this kind of stuff. So I was supposed to kind of promote and exalt that lifestyle that the Lord had delivered me from. And I had watched friends fall off a cliff in, you know, I'd watch them go to their death and, and suicides and overdoses and get HIV in that life and everything else. I mean, I narrowly escaped death. And so I couldn't with a clear conscience support that. So I went to my boss and we were good friends, had a great working relationship. I really respected him. He taught me a lot. And so I just told him straight up front, I said, I, I can't do this. I can't with a clear conscience um, endorse this kind of lifestyle this agenda so he tried to kind of work with me and swap my swap my responsibilities with other folks but it was like chewing gum in your hair that you can't get out it just kept coming across my desk over and over because it became entangled with everything we were doing almost it seemed and so uh, over time then i was witnessing within the department i was it would kind of became my mission <laughs> I was so missions minded because the lord had delivered me from so much like the the banking thing was um not very important anymore you know what i mean like daily worldly life was not important so much anymore i really wanted to share the gospel with people i thought what if this guy dies i really care about him what if she dies i care about her if they die without christ like it's the most important mm -hmm. thing to me so i'm sharing the gospel in the workplace i got called in reprimanded for that and then the lgbt thing that i tried to get off my plate and that didn't work out so well and finally at the end of it all um i, I was told kind of in the middle, we have plans for you. If you, you just keep your mouth shut, kind of keep your head down. <laughs> we have plans for you, but um, the Lord had a greater plan. And, and so the Lord let out, long story short, um, it was kind of, kind of came down to maybe this isn't the place for you if you're not willing to comply, if you're not willing to conform to corporate values, diversity and inclusion, diversity being one of them. And so the Lord let out, that was the end of 2015. Um, so I'm kind of embattled with the world here. I'm kind of being, I'm kind of taking fire from the world and Satan through the world. And then over here on the church side, I'm not always accepted either. Oh, I'd like to say it was all roses and cherries on the church side, but it wasn't. It hasn't been. And so um, because of the depth of my past sin and because of the depth of my testimony and the unusual unrelatability i guess you would say of the homosexuality thing and the same-sex attraction and i would stand up in front of the church down in pittsburgh big church most a lot of people liked me and, and uh, appreciated me but 
that there were some there that thought, I, I can't get with this. I can't fathom what he's talking about it. You know what I mean? I wanted to reach out to the LGBT and share the gospel and so on. Not everybody was on board with that. I was very upfront with my testimony. Not everybody wanted to hear that. It involved alcohol, warnings against alcoholism and drug use. Some of the folks in the church maybe were dabbling in alcohol and that kind of stuff. Um, nowadays in churches, a lot of things are approved that weren't several generations ago. So long story short, I, I kind of had trouble being accepted in, in church circles and um, mm. telling the truth, if you will. And so when I decided when the Lord led to come to Cambodia beginning of 2000, end of 2015, beginning 2016, I didn't sign on with a big missions organization that would, that would control me through accountability, excessive accountability, because that's what I had seen in church circles in Pittsburgh and, and elsewhere. And the church circles that I ran in were thinking, Oh, all these ministers that we see on TV are falling right and left and all these different people that we thought were standing so strong. I know how to solve the problem. Tackle them at the waist. Excessive accountability to a point where there's no freedom in Christ. You're going to do what I think you should do. You're going to meet with me every Wednesday at 8 o'clock and tell me everything you did this week. That kind of thing. And to me, it was so suffocating. And it was so uh, bizarre to me, like the Lord had really set me free from certain deaths. And so nothing could stop me from getting getting through the doors of the church. Nothing could stop me from serving the Lord. And so these people were running at me like, you're a risk, you're a risk, you're going to fall like the other ones. Let's do this accountability ritual every week and so on. And it was like smothering my relationship with the Lord. And so I, I talked to the the, it was actually um, a big denomination that the church was affiliated with. And when I came to Cambodia, I talked to the acting field director over here about the possibility of coming over under them. And uh, he said, accountability is a beautiful thing. And to me, his, his countenance and his face was like a comic book villain, I like to say. It was not endearing. There wasn't anything comforting about it. It was like, we will control your every move kind of thing. And I thought, I ain't doing that. I'm not leaving a corporation to serve the Lord in my new life and being controlled more than I was inside of a corporation against the will of God. You know what I mean? Like you're going to sign on with them in something that possibly, quite possibly supersedes the will of God, some kind of corporate ritual kind of thing within the church. I wasn't willing to do that. And so long story short, the Lord led to create a nonprofit. We have a small nonprofit called Castaway Ministries now and um, kind of did homegrown or organic. We have a, a small board and, and go around, uh, have churches that support back home and individual supporters and praise the Lord. He's really provided and, and led. So first connected through folks that I knew here from the short term missions and then built from there, have a lot of contacts here and a lot of church family. And, and like I said, the Lord recently led to to plant this new church here in my neighborhood. Um, so that's kind of separate from the LGBT outreach. Typically, since 2016, I had been going even on long term motorbike rides. Everybody's on a motorbike or a scooter over here because the weather's good. It's tropics over here. So you go on your motorbike instead of your car, typically. And I would go on the motorbike and drop by somewhere to get a, a you know, a bottle of water and, and the folks would start asking, where are you from and why are you here? And then the Lord would lead, lead to share the gospel with them, to share testimony. The Lord would lead to a, I'd have a problem with the motorbike, go to the repair shop. The Lord would lead very strategically to someone there or maybe the hairdresser that struggles with homosexuality that's next door to the, the moto mechanic. Very, very creatively led me to, to different people in different places, very small villages and all kinds of amazing stuff. And so I did a lot of that and um, taught the kids here all that time uh, since 2018. I've been teaching the kids on Sunday and then uh, just kind of had like a free space here on the first floor of the apartment building that I live in. The manager had allowed kind of an open air space. It's like a public space, just a table. And so I had done that for quite a, quite a few years and had relationships with the families and the, the parents of the kids and that sort of thing. So everybody in the neighborhood knows everybody it's like a small town and i grew up in a small town in pennsylvania so it feels 
similar in an unusual way, Cambodia, U.S., but still small town is small town. And, and so uh, having built those relationships, that's kind of the foundation for the church. So the church is nearly entirely youth at the moment. It's only a couple couple months old, and we have a few adults, but um, youth are really the foundation, and they're actually trained up um, you know, in some ways similar to how an adult would be trained up several years in, into the Word and, and really walk through a lot of Bible lessons with them. They know who the primary Old Testament Bible characters are. They can share the gospel. We do old-fashioned door-to-door evangelism here, which is, is still kind of a norm in Cambodia among the churches. And so um, it's a simple ministry, also very complex because of Buddhism and the indoctrination and mm-hmm. Um, a lot of things unique to Cambodia. The language is, is obviously very foreign. It's not like Spanish or Italian. It's it's like a script language, like deciphering code kind of thing. So it's a lot to bite off. And and um, so a lot of my week right now is is prayerfully writing the sermons in the beginning of the week and then translating those sermons to Cambodian language and then running them by as best I can, and then running them by someone like test preaching a friend, kind of sitting across the table with somebody, test preaching to them, and then fixing, working out the kinks, and uh, fixing some some words and pronunciation and that sort of thing so that I'm ready for Sunday, and then uh, the music ministry and all that kind of stuff. So it's a small church and, and really, really a blessing. I really, I guess because I come from a corporate background and a lot of policies and procedures. I love the simple life. I'm I'm so thankful to Mm -hmm. be, it feels free to be in a small church and, uh, you know, have a simple program and, and uh, it's a simpler place to live. It's a, it's more agricultural based. There's some tourism industry here too, but a lot of people are farmers and things are open air and slower paced. And people ask you, commonly how many brothers and sisters do you have and questions like that are kind of everyday thing here how many brothers and sisters do you have did you eat rice yet which is like asking somebody did you eat breakfast yet Um, (laughs) just just a simpler simpler life i'm so blessed to be here cambodians are very sweet people and and such a blessing to to serve praise the lord yeah I, I think it sounds like a, a wonderful uh, ministry with lots of different things going on there that God has definitely blessed your time there, blessed the Cambodians, and we pray that that continues to, to happen over there. Um, I know we, we also just really just scratched the surface about some of your story, your testimony, and everything that God has faithfully done in your life. So for those in the audience that want to to check up on you or find a little bit more information about you uh, where th- where can they find more information about you after the show uh castawayministries.org c a s t c a s t a w a y have to remind myself how to spell it castawayministries.org is the the website for the nonprofit and then uh, website for this kind of thing. I've written a few books and, and done some interviews about my testimony and that sort of thing, what the Lord's done in my new life. And that's through xgaywitness.com, xgaywitness.com. Wonderful. All right. Well, I'll, I'll get that all linked down there. Everyone definitely check that out. I know that there's all sorts of other stories and, and definitely checking out the books there to to learn more about uh, not not all that uh, I know Matthew would say this that that he has done, but what God has done in his life, and well, we want to uh, really really praise him through that because uh, he's he's the one that does good in our lives, not not our own doing. So, Matthew, again, great having you on. I loved hearing the story. I love hearing uh, missions-minded people too, and you have a very specific call in here. So, uh, thanks again so much for for being on the show with us today. Thanks for having me. God bless. Absolutely. All right. Well, everyone, thank you uh, for joining us on another episode of Faithfully Engaged. And uh, let's just keep fighting for truth. You guys take care.